Welcome. Uh, welcome to Massey College. My name is Nathalie Desrosiers and I'm the principal of Massey College. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to uh, another uh, Senior Fellows Lunch. Merci beaucoup à tous qui êtes ici en présentiel. Uh, thank you for coming uh, in body to uh, these, uh, these events and also thank you to all of our online audience. I first want to acknowledge that Massey College is built on indigenous lands, the lands of the Euronwanda, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. It is the treaty land of the Mississaugas of the Credit. And it's a great privilege for us uh, to continue to do our work here. So uh, without further ado, I'm really looking forward to this presentation. I am so glad that uh, Payam Akavan has, has agreed to do another event for us. Uh, uh, Payam did the book club on uh, Monday night as well, so I think this is uh, more than that, what I usually ask of a senior fellow, but so I thank you very much for doing this. So without further ado, uh, Mohammed, uh, please introduce our guests. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone and thank you for joining us. It is an honor to introduce Professor Payam Akhavan, who is a member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration at The Hague the special advisor on genocide to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. Recently, Professor Akhavan was appointed counsel to the newly established Commission of Small Island States on Climate Change and International Law. He was previously full professor at McGill University Faculty of Law, 2005 to 2020, and Ferdinand Brodel Senior Fellow at, at European University Institute with other appointments at Yale Law School, Oxford University, University of Paris, and Leiden University. He has published extensively on international criminal law, and in 2017, he elegantly delivered the CBC <coughs> Massey Lectures. Per Professor Akhavan was the first legal advisor to the prosecutor's Office of International Cri Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, 1994 to 2000, and also served with the UN in Bosnia, Cambodia, Guatemala, Rwanda, and East Timor. He has served as counsel in notable cases before the International Criminal Court, the International Court of Justice, the European Court of Human Rights, the Supreme Court of Canada, and the Supreme Court of the United States. He also serves as senior advisor to the Ministry of Global Affairs on flight PS752 tragedy, is a senior fellow and Canadian co-chair of the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights and co-founder of the Iran Human Rights Documentation Center. He is recipient of the 2021 Human Rights Award of the Law Society of Ontario and is human rights, and his human rights work has been featured in the New York Times BBC Hard Talk, CBC Ideas, Maclean's, and other media. Please join me welcoming Professor Akhavan. Um, merci beaucoup, Nathalie, de m'avoir invité. Um, thank you. Um, also, Professor Tavakoli for that very kind introduction, and it was a pleasure to be able to shake your hand, uh, knowing that I would not be vilified by everyone uh, as we uh, are slowly emerging out of the pandemic. I also wanted to thank um, uh, Alyssa and Joe for uh, all of their kind assistance in arranging for this presentation today. Most of us today are preoccupied with the horrific scenes of the war uh, unfolding in Ukraine. And perhaps because uh, our attention is focused on 
these terrible scenes of human suffering, we have not given sufficient attention to the most recent report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that was submitted a few days ago. I will begin by saying that when the previous report was submitted in 2021, the Secretary General of the United Nations said that it is code red for humanity. That is how he uh, uh, characterized that report. So one can only imagine what the most recent report would be characterized as insofar as humankind has not in any fundamental way even begun to change the patterns of uh, uh, consumption, uh, economic uh, production, and what have you that have brought us to the precipice of uh, self-destruction. So the Secretary General put it uh, bluntly. He said, delay is death. Delay is death. And those are words that we need to take very seriously, not least when we see world leaders uh, going back in time to the sort of uh, short-sighted, uh, divisive uh, balance of power politics, which really have no place at a time when our collective survival uh, depends uh, on uh, establishing the institutions and ways of seeing the world um, without which uh, our uh, survival as a species will be uh, at risk. So I wanted to speak today about how small island states, the smallest of nations on Earth, are in some respects leading the way for the rest of humankind. Just as many of the leaders of the most powerful countries are asleep at the switch, it is the leaders of these smallest of nations that are speaking truth to power and reminding us that what is happening to them today will happen to all of us tomorrow. So I will begin perhaps by speaking a bit about the history um, of the uh, climate change movement, the climate justice movement, which most recently led to what is a remarkable initiative by small island states to use the legitimacy of international law, the power of legitimacy of international law, in order to try and change the conversation uh, about climate change. So if we look at the first slide um, in, um, if we could go to the first slide, please. Yeah, so in 1990, the Alliance of Small Island States was uh, created, in large part through the leadership of uh, the Maldives, one of the countries whose fate with rising sea levels has really uh, become symbolic of uh, the fact that many small island states are literally going to disappear uh, in the foreseeable future if global warming is not uh, reduced. And um, the uh, Establishment of AOSIS in 1990 was prescient because the idea of global warning, warming really only gained uh, uh, popularity or, or sort of uh, became part of the public discourse in 1988, just two years earlier, when James Hansen, a uh, NASA scientist, in his testimony before the US Congress, began to speak about uh, the effect of human activity on, on the climate. Now, in, if we go to the next slide, in 1992, at the uh, so-called Rio Earth Summit, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was adopted. And as the title suggests, it was a framework convention, which means that it enunciated general principles which would guide the deliberations and negotiations of states um, as they moved forward in tackling climate change with subsequent uh, agreements. And the basic principle of the uh, UN Framework Convention um, was that the parties should protect the climate system for the benefit of present and future generations of humankind. So the idea that um, international law protects the rights of future generations is not just about uh, us today, it is also about others uh, tomorrow. 
on the basis of equity and in accordance with their common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. So while it is true, as many say, that we are all in this together, uh, some are much more responsible <laughs> for the uh, unfolding catastrophe that we witness compared to others. So the idea of common but differentiated responsibilities recognized that the industrialized countries and the major polluters um, have a bigger burden to bear in addressing the issue of climate change. However, in the subsequent years that followed, and every year there would be a, a, a conference of parties, meaning to say conference of parties to the UN Framework Convention, otherwise known as COP, um, over the su succeeding years, uh, small island states uh, attempted to raise the issue of loss and damages. And in fact, AOSIS was established in 1990 in large part because small island states were at the forefront of the impacts of climate change with rising sea levels, uh, 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 extreme weather events that were particularly vulnerable already in 1990. So one can imagine what their situation is now. And they raised the issue of loss and damages, meaning to say that rising sea levels, ocean acidification, uh, coral bleaching, the loss of marine biodiversity, and all these other um, uh, currents that were afflicting small island states um, were not the result of natural forces, but were the result of human activity. They were the result of political choices, and therefore that the major polluters must assume liability, responsibility for the loss and damage caused as a result. But through the 26 years from 1992 until the last COP in Glasgow in November of 2021, there has been a stubborn refusal to address the issue of uh, loss and damages. So if we go to the next slide, at the, um, in 2015, when the Paris Agreement uh, was uh, concluded, um, there was once again an attempt to put loss and damages on the agenda uh, of the COP process. And of course, uh, one understands why uh, the question of climate change has to be first and foremost a question of cooperation and negotiation uh, rather than legislation and litigation. There are many complex issues. There are multidimensionals. There is not a single culprit, but there is a whole systemic uh, problem that needs to be uh, addressed. But nonetheless, uh, in the COP deliberations, there was once again a refusal to discuss loss and damages. And Article 8 of the Paris Agreement, which may be too small for you to read, addresses loss and damages really in a very non-committal way. It simply says that parties recognize the importance of averting, minimizing, and addressing loss and damage associated with the adverse effects of climate change, including extreme weather events and uh, slow onset events, and the role of sustainable development in reducing the risk of loss and damages. So there's a vague commitment to trying to reduce um, the uh, risk of uh, loss and damage without any uh, firm commitment. And the mechanism which was established by the Paris Agreement to address this issue was the Warsaw International Mechanism, which is largely an advisory body. Uh, and as uh, lawyers would say, uh, it is relatively uh, toothless. There is really no effective means of enforcement uh, in respect even of the very uh, vague and voluntary commitments that states have assumed under the Paris Agreement. So, um, if we go to the next slide, here we uh, see the trail smelter case, um, which reminds us that as early as 1938, when an arbitral award um, uh, was rendered in respect of a dispute between the United States and Canada regarding transboundary pollution, the principle was established um, that states have an obligation or duty of due diligence to ensure that their territory is not used in a way that would cause harm to other 
States. Now, Trail is a town in British Columbia which had a smelter and the smelter was uh, spewing, I believe, uh, uh, sulfur dioxide fumes across the border uh, and the wind would carry it into Washington state where it caused significant uh, damage to uh, uh, agriculture and forests and, and wildlife. So Canada and the United States agreed to uh, arbitrate the question of loss and damages uh, resulting as a result of this transboundary pollution. And already in 1938, uh, that principle was recognized that the polluter pays. You pollute, you pay. You cause harm to a neighboring state, you must pay uh, loss and damages. So the question is, why is this principle not being applied in respect of global warming? Of course, global warming is more diffuse than toxic fumes coming across the border from one state to the other. But in principle, it is no different. Major polluters that are not heeding their obligations under the Paris Agreement, uh, that are not taking seriously the unmistakable uh, 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 scientific evidence uh, that continuing business as usual is going to result in a catastrophic uh, climate change, and in respect of small island states, it will literally result in their extinction, um, should be liable for loss and damages in the way that a state that dumps toxic waste off the coast of another state uh, should be. So with a view to changing the conversation in the COP process uh, and bearing in mind that all of their efforts have failed, failed even to ensure that a commitment to establish a loss and damages fund in 2009 for $100 billion dollars which would be a drop in the bucket if one really thinks about the cost, the actual cost of climate change, that even that promise uh, has not been fulfilled. So the small island states, uh, frustrated by this, these empty words, by this uh, lack of uh, commitment to taking uh, the issue of climate justice seriously, have now turned to international courts and tribunals um, as a way of uh, how do you say, creating a more even uh, field. And one can imagine, uh, uh, one cannot imagine a greater David and Goliath uh, contest because some of these island states, for example, Tuvalu, about which we will speak later, has a population of uh, 11,000. Uh, Nauru has a population of 20,000. Maldives has a population of some uh, 500,000 people. So these small island states are trying to group together uh, in order to force the most powerful states that also happen to be the major polluters to somehow uh, change their conduct and to take seriously the consequences of their actions. So there are two initiatives that I will uh, address today. Uh, the first, if we go to the next slide, uh, is an initiative from the Republic of Vanuatu uh, in the uh, South Pacific to um, bring an advisory opinion before the International Court of Justice in The Hague. And of course, an advisory opinion um, is not an adversarial process in the sense that it is not a contentious dispute between two parties which would result in a binding judgment. Uh, it is a bit uh, like the references before our Supreme Court, an opportunity for the court authoritatively to define the principles and rules of international law that should apply to a given uh, subject. But nonetheless, there is what we call uh, a certain compliance pull uh, to uh, such authoritative pronouncements uh, insofar as in the international community, um, one hopes at least that states, at least for the sake of their legitimacy, cannot turn a blind eye to international law, although given what is happening in the world today, that may be wishful thinking on my part. So if you go to the next slide, um, this is the International uh, Court of Justice. Uh, this is the so-called Peace Palace in The Hague, which in fact was uh, constructed in uh, 1913, even before the League of Nations, to seat the permanent court of arbitration, uh, but which subsequently became the seat of the Permanent Court of International Justice under the League of Nations, 
and then the International Court of Justice, or ICJ, uh, under the UN system. Now, in order for the court to be seized of jurisdiction, and this is one of the peculiarities of international law, courts do not have automatic jurisdiction, something which we don't have to worry about within uh, the Canadian legal system. So state consent is not only the source of international law, but it is also the source of jurisdiction. So the usefulness of an advisory opinion is that one does not need the consent of any state because, in fact, one is not submitting a particular dispute for adjudication. One is simply seeking an opinion, but, in fact, that opinion has bearing on existing uh, disputes. But the advisory opinion jurisdiction of the court is subject to Article 96, which is the next slide. And Article 96 provides that the General Assembly or the Security Council may request the ICJ to give an advisory opinion on any legal question. Um, other uh, organs of the UN and specialized agencies, uh, the World Health Organization, the International Labor Organization and the like, may also within their uh, fields of specialized activity request opinions. But in order to um, uh, basically invoke Article 96 and get before the court, one has to have a majority of the votes in the General Assembly. So once again, we uh, get into the uh, politics of the General Assembly. What is the relative influence of the major polluters as opposed to small island states? And even if small island states uh, uh, have alliances with climate vulnerable states, it is still quite a struggle to try and get a majority vote in the General Assembly, bearing in mind that the major polluters do not want this issue to be uh, reduced to questions of uh, international law, uh, obligations, and liability for loss and damages. But there is another uh, less known tribunal, if you go to the next slide, which is the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, otherwise known as uh, ITLOS, and that is the view of the inside of the court. It sits in uh, Hamburg, Germany. It was established under the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And uh, this is one of the most ambitious uh, treaties that was ever negotiated. Um, it was negotiated over almost a decade in what was the third UN conference on Law of the Sea, which began in 1973 and only concluded in 1982. And the Law of the Sea Convention, which has over 300 articles, numerous annexes, addresses uh, everything from uses of the continental shelf, uh, 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 fisheries, uh, maritime boundaries, the regime of straits and questions of innocent passage, and a whole range of issues. But part 12 of the convention, as I will explain shortly, addresses the question of the marine environment. And it is remarkable, as we will shortly uh, explore, what the UN Convention said about the obligations of states in respect of the marine environment 10 years before the UN Framework Convention was adopted. So in a sense, we are trying to retrieve principles and rules which already existed before global warming even became an issue. So if we go to the next slide, Article 138 of the uh, ITLOS rules provides that the tribunal may give an advisory opinion on a legal question if an international agreement related to the purposes of the convention specifically provides for the submission to the tribunal of a request for such an opinion. So unlike Article 96 of the UN Charter, which would require a very politicized process of getting a majority vote in the General Assembly, the rules of uh, ITLOS, which is a, a, a understandably a specialized tribunal limited to questions of the law of the sea, whereas the ICJ is a court of general jurisdiction. But with respect to ITLOS, there is no need to go through that politicized process so long as there is an international agreement which authorizes a body to request such an opinion. And the commission that was recently uh, established 
which Professor Tavakoli referred to, uh, is in part a vehicle to allow small island states to bypass some of the uh, politics which would otherwise impede their recourse to international courts and tribunals. So if we um, go to the next slide, we see here part 12 um, uh, of the UN Convention uh, on the Law of the Sea, otherwise known as, as UNCLOS. And Article 192 provides simply that states have the obligation to protect and preserve the marine uh, environment. Now, if we go to the next slide, we will see that the jurisprudence, for example, in the South China Sea arbitration, has uh, explained that this general obligation extends to both protection of the marine environment from future damage and preservation in the sense of maintaining or improving its present condition. And this has obvious application to global warming. Article 192 thus entails the positive obligation to take active measures to protect and preserve the marine environment. And by logical implication, entails the negative obligation not to degrade the marine environment. So this is really blindingly obvious, which brings us back to the question of why the resistance to apply um, pre-existing rules and principles of international law to the conversation on climate change. It is right there. If you dump toxic waste uh, in uh, the uh, exclusive economic zone of a country in their coastal waters, well, then you're liable uh, for loss and damages. And not only that, you have a positive obligation to ensure the, uh, that the marine environment is preserved and, and protected. So one of the questions, of course, is, well, um, ITLOS uh, is not a court of general jurisdiction under the ICJ, so can we really address climate change uh, effectively? And this goes to the fact that, of course, for small island states, the oceans are particularly relevant to climate change. Most of their loss and damages, uh, virtually all of it, rising sea levels, extreme weather events, uh, 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 ocean acidification, and uh, all of the other uh, consequences of global warming are felt um, through the marine uh, environment. Um, and in fact, the oceans are overwhelmingly the biggest sink for uh, carbon in the world. So the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea addresses a very significant proportion of the issues relating to climate change. So in quick succession, I'm just going to show you some slides just as illustrations. If we go to the next slide, here we see a chart showing um, the uh, change in uh, Earth's total heat content, indicating how much of that uh, is in the land uh, 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 and atmosphere and ice uh, as opposed to the oceans. And I think the chart speaks for itself. If we go to the next slide, we see here that 93.4% of global warming uh, goes uh, into the oceans, is absorbed uh, by the oceans. Um, next slide. Here we see another chart which shows the dramatic rise in ocean heat from 1960 until uh, 2015. Uh, and the scientific evidence is uh, unmistakable and uh, inescapable. And one more, uh, the next slide as well. Here is another graphic showing the uh, alarming rate at which uh, the ocean temperature is increasing uh, across the world. So we shouldn't be uh, surprised by the dramatic changes uh, in climate patterns and extreme weather events and what have you, much of which is regulated by the uh, oceans. So bearing in mind the frustration of the small island states um, and their desire to invoke international uh, law. On the first day of COP26, um, uh, not in Glasgow, but in the nearby city of uh, Edinburgh, uh, the prime ministers of two small island states um, uh, engaged in a remarkable uh, initiative. And if we go to the next slide, 
we will see that uh, Tuvalu, uh, population 10,000 in the South Pacific, um, and Antigua and Barbuda uh, in the Caribbean, the prime ministers um, decided to conclude an agreement on October 31st, the first day of COP, uh, in order to establish uh, a commission of small island states on climate change and international law in order to allow for collective action by, sm for sm by small island states to address uh, issues of climate change, including loss and damages. And that uh, uh, commission, as I will explain later, is specifically empowered, among other things, to request advisory opinions from uh, ITLOS. And if and when it does so, it would become a historic case. It would become the first uh, interstate procedure which would address the liability of states for climate change. So maybe we can briefly look at why Tuvalu and Antigua are so frustrated and why they took this very uh, unprecedented and courageous initiative. If we go to the next slide, here is an image of uh, Tuvalu uh, in the South Pacific. And that runway that you see there um, covers much of the islands. There are about two or three flights a week. And when the airplanes are not coming, there are children uh, playing on the runway. It is a sort of a place where communities gather to have uh, picnics and play games. And there is a sort of siren when the aircraft arrives telling everyone to clear the runway. Just something to bear in mind if you decide to travel there. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, some of you will be familiar with this image of the foreign minister of Tuvalu uh, addressing COP26 um, from um, what was once dry land on Tuvalu. And Tuvalu is one of the countries that will almost certainly go underwater. It will disappear in the foreseeable future um, uh, unless uh, there is a dramatic change uh, in uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions. So they are making a very stark point, as many other speakers did at COP26. Uh, 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 the Prime Minister of Barbados said that climate change is a death sentence for small island states. The President of Palau said, you may as well bomb us because uh, this is a slow and agonizing death that our people will go through. And of course, in uh, Tuvalu also, um, you have uh, indigenous peoples for whom it's not that simple to simply resettle let's say, from Tuvalu to New Zealand or Australia or Fiji or some other island uh, with uh, some other state with high ground. Uh, many of them will speak about the fact that their ancestors are buried uh, in these territories and that uh, they have a very visceral spiritual connection uh, with their land. If we go to the next image, this is the island of Barbuda after Hurricane Irma in 2017. The island was uh, annihilated, and uh, the entire population had to be uh, evacuated. And sadly, it's only a matter of time before this devastation will occur again. And of course, this creates also a, a debt trap uh, for these small island states that have to finance the uh, reconstruction. And by the time the island is rebuilt, there will be yet another even more extreme uh, weather event uh, that will bring them back once again to where they were before. And at some point, you simply have to give up. You have to stop rebuilding because you realize that it's simply not sustainable anymore uh, to live uh, on a particular territory. So if we go to the next slide, it was at COP26 in uh, Glasgow uh, uh, amidst uh, all the speeches by charismatic leaders and all the uh, promises that were made. And I don't want to be entirely cynical. There was certain progress achieved, but not nearly enough if we go back to what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report is, is telling us, that we need to take uh, urgent and drastic action um, for the survival of uh, humankind. So at uh, COP26, um, I was uh, asked to uh, uh, organize a, a signing ceremony for the two uh, prime ministers. Um, and uh, among the greatest skills that an international lawyer can have, if we go to the next slide, is knowing how to cut flags <laughs> desperately printed out from Google images. 
uh, because flags of the two states were not available and it would be unthinkable to have a signing ceremony for flags. So the purpose of this presentation was just a pretext to show you my artistic skills. <laughs> Um, and you will see here the restaurant menu holders, which came in very uh, handy in order to create these flags. If we go to the next slide, um, here we have uh, the uh, Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda uh, on your left, and on the right, the Prime Minister of uh, Tuvalu, uh, having signed the agreement uh, and uh, shaking hands and looking forward to how this agreement um, can now be expanded to include other small island states. Uh, and the model of beginning with a bilateral agreement which matures into multilateral agreement was one way of avoiding a prolonged multilateral negotiations which could have taken years and years and uh, uh, never sort of really uh, come to uh, fruition. So this was also a sort of interesting model um, of uh, trying to address multilateral issues through what is initially a bilateral initiative. And then uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, these are just um, uh, copies of the agreements. We can go to the next slide as well. And you will see that Article 2, Paragraph 2, provides that having regard to the fundamental importance of oceans as sinks and reservoirs of greenhouse gases, and the direct relevance of the marine environment to the adverse effects of climate change on small island states, the Commission shall be authorized to request advisory opinions from ITLOS. So now there is a vehicle through which small island states can, without political interference, uh, engage international courts and tribunals. And if we really believe in a rule-oriented international order, then we should actually uh, commend them uh, for this uh, initiative. And in effect, it's remarkable that the smallest of islands are exercising global leadership. And basically, um, it is the case that small island states are the canary in the coal mine of catastrophic climate change. Uh, what happens to them today will happen to all of us tomorrow. So these leaders of the smallest island states are engaging in planetary politics. So in a sense, we should not see this as an adverse sort of litigation, but as a way of changing the conversation to say, well, what are the fundamental principles of international law that we've accepted all along? And why are we avoiding them when it comes to the single uh, greatest challenge to our existence as a human species. And I think that history will look kindly at these leaders for having uh, taken this courageous step. If we go to the next slide, uh, this is just further images of the agreements, uh, the signatures of the two prime ministers. Uh, we can go to the next slide. This is the uh, press conference that was held um, with the two prime ministers at uh, COP26. And the good news was that in the middle of COP, um, we already had our first customer. We go to the next slide. This is the president of Palau, who contacted us in the middle of COP, says, I want to sign this agreement. So we scrambled on the train from uh, Edinburgh to Glasgow and made it through the two mile long security line and um, got him to sign this agreement. In fact, if we look at the next slide, at the Tuvalu exhibit, with these uh, polar bears with life jackets, which was uh, the creation of a, a Taiwanese artist, a rather stark reminder of what is happening uh, to our world. Um, so if we go to the next slide, there has been uh, extensive media coverage, which has been very interesting. The Le Monde, New York Times, Washington Post, uh, I could add to that, CBC, uh, Time Magazine. Um, so there is a great support and enthusiasm uh, for this uh, uh, initiative uh, in civil society, in the media space, in the academic space, uh, but there are still many challenges uh, in order for small island states to be able to uh, uh, group together and change the conversation given the very serious challenges uh, that they face. Um, and if we uh, go to the uh, final slide, um, here are polar bears without life jackets, uh, a reminder uh, 
uh, of the urgency uh, with which we need to uh, address uh, uh, the question of uh, climate change, uh, the reduction of uh, uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions, um, and uh, at the very least, um, perhaps taking the question of loss and damages, liability for loss and damages more seriously could act as a deterrence for the major polluters to understand that uh, while we are beginning with an advisory opinion around the corner, there could be also adversarial litigation uh, against the major polluters, uh, against uh, companies that are also complicit um, in this uh, willful blindness. Um, and uh, perhaps that will uh, allow us to uh, begin to exact a, a cost. So I'm going to uh, once again thank um, uh, Massey College for this kind invitation uh, and uh, to thank all of you for uh, having listened to me and I'm very happy to um, engage in a conversation with you now. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Rahman, for your enlightening presentation. In addition to your climate diplomacy and legal action, I was really impressed with your flag-making skills. <laughs> if you allow, we could entertain a few questions. Of course, of course. Please. And you will moderate? As you wish. Yes. So the purpose of the commission will be to get an advisory uh, opinion with the view of calculating or expressing the liability for the loss of these islands. Do, what can you imagine in terms of, of uh, what will be the result? You know, what, do you want, is the point to establish a presumed liability for, for example, some of the countries who have failed to comply with whatever they promised is it also to uh, establish the principle that these small islands, you know, people have to move and, and you know, they should be compensated now or they should have a, a plan uh, to, to be restored? Or what's, give us a little bit more detail of what we should look for in the, in the next little while in the, in the litigation. Uh, thank you, uh, Principal de Rosier, for that very good question. I, I would uh, begin by saying that, well, the mandate of the Commission, I didn't want to take you through the entire agreement, time doesn't allow us to do that, but the mandate is broadly to contribute to the progressive development of uh, international uh, law. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, just as uh, 1945 was a seminal moment for human rights, and all of a sudden we went from a state-centric to a human-centric conception of international law with human dignity being at the center of the international order, I think that we are now witnessing a seismic shift from an anthropocentric <laughs> view of uh, uh, not just international law but our place in the universe to an understanding that we're just an insignificant speck in an infinite universe and that in a contest with Mother Earth, we're going to lose. The Earth will go on, we will become extinct. So the, the, the idea is that international law is going to go through radical changes in the coming years in respect of our stewardship of the environment. Uh, we can look to some of our uh, indigenous peoples to <laughs> gain some inspiration uh, uh, in respect of how we should reimagine the notion of uh, law. Um, so the mandate is to contribute to the progressive development of international law at a time when there are going to be very dramatic uh, changes. Now, in terms of how that is going to be achieved, that is a decision for the members of the Commission, not for me. I simply take instructions from the members of the Commission. And the Commission is just a few months old, um, uh, and several other states are in the process of joining. And as they join and they begin this conversation, uh, that will be part of what they need to decide. How are they going to move forward? But I'm going to mention that there are already some important initiatives. So, for example, the UN International Law Commission, an expert body established by the General Assembly, uh, already is uh, uh, conducting studies on sea level rise. What are the implications of sea level rise on small island states? What happens when your coast begins to retreat? 
uh, what happens to your maritime zones, your fisheries rights, what happens if you lose all of your territory? Does that state continue to exist? So these are you know, intellectually uh, fascinating issues, but also catastrophic issues for the people whose homes are, are being lost. So there are expert bodies who are conducting those sort of studies. Uh, there are discussions now about uh, a number of new treaties. Um, there is uh, now a decision, finally, to conclude a treaty on plastic pollution. Uh, and of course, we know the catastrophic effect that has on uh, marine life. Um, but I think that litigation perhaps occupies a special place in our imagination, in our idea of what law is about. And one could say there's even a ritualistic aspect to, uh, you know, uh, council and state representatives coming to an international court and speaking about um, the issues which are challenging their very uh, survival uh, and uh, seeing how that process itself, not just the jurisprudence, but the process itself could help reshape the dynamics at future uh, COP negotiations. Thank you very much for, for that. That was, it's fascinating. Uh, my question is, in terms of the advisory opinion being sought, um, is there, is part of it going to be on how one would go about, um, not just not quantifying, but identifying the, the appropriate damages, you know, to marine, to the marine life, uh, the mineral side, loss of agricultural land, human people displacement, will it, does the advisory opinion encompass that as well in terms of what might be ju judiciable elements of a, of a damage claim? Um, so that was one question. And, and the second question was about the human displacement. And maybe you could comment on that as well as, you know, there's some discussion about whether we need a protocol on climate change displacement, particularly from the small island states. And the seeking of justice, not just through the international court or or through these tribunals, but also the case last year of Kiribati. And maybe you could comment on that as well as they mm -hmm. went through ECOSOC and, and the Human Rights Committee. Thank you. Uh, yes, th thank you, Ambassador. Uh, those are two very good questions. I'll be begin with the second one uh, uh, first, the question of resettlement, which is now being seriously uh, discussed. Uh, and countries like uh, Kiribati, of course, uh, are so small in population that one could easily resettle the entire country in uh, New Zealand or Fiji or Australia or, or what have you. But what do we do with uh, Bangladesh, where there could be 60, 70 million climate refugees? Uh, this is the most densely populated country in the world, and it's also well known that you know the Bay of Bengal, the, the Bengal Delta is sinking, is sinking. Um, so uh, there are also a number of initiatives through human rights mechanisms. There is a case now pending before the European Court of Human Rights brought by a group of Portuguese youth. Um, there was a case that was brought before the uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child. Um, but these uh, sort of uh, mechanisms may have a different and more limited impact than interstate uh, proceedings. And obviously, the question of resettlement would be subsumed in the larger question of uh, loss and damages. Now, I have to be cautious about answering your first question, because, um, as I said, uh, what question is eventually put to ITLOS and whether it will be put to ITLOS is a decision for the members of the Commission to make. But ITLOS uh, is limited to subject matters falling under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And there may be aspects um, such as desertification and, and what have you, which may or may not fall under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. But when it comes to the marine environment, um, Part 12 um, sets out, uh, it, 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 Part 12 includes a land-based and atmospheric pollution as well. So for example, if toxic waste is being dumped in a river, which then pollutes uh, the sea, that would fall uh, within the uh, ambit uh, of the UN Convention. So the question would be why the same should not apply to uh, the emission of uh, greenhouse gases. Um, some of the effects of global warming on the oceans, 
ocean acidification, the pH balance, loss of marine biodiversity, uh, coastal erosion, rising sea levels, those would appear very clearly to fall within the provisions of UNCLOS. Um, how much one could go beyond those issues uh, remains to be seen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.